Thanks very much, Stuart, and thanks to the Asthma Respiratory Foundation for the invitation to speak today. Um, it is great uh, to be, hopefully with my presentation, be able to give you um, or raise your profile of children's sleep and um, breathing easy at night, uh, not just during the day. And um, to also um, raise the perspective of sleep apnea in children as well. Children's sleep is very important for children's health. And I often use this quote um, from an editorial from Carol Marcus, who is one of the godmothers of pediatric sleep medicine, written some years ago now, that depending on the age, um, children sleep as much as 50 to 65% of their lives. And increasing attention to this other half of life can only improve the health and development of our children. And while there are over 60 different diagnosable pediatric sleep disorders, ranging from non-respiratory behavioral sleep issues to respiratory disorders, OSA um, sleep apnea is the most common. However, unfortunately, to, uh, to the general public, snoring is, is quite often uh, neglected and under-recognized and also considered quite normal. Mum, dad, grandparents snore, so, so that's normal, right? Wrong. And that's a, a different perspective, I think, that I'd like to try and bring to you all in your clinical practice is, is to raise recognition that, uh, that sleep apnea exists in children and that it's not normal. I think it's, it, it, it's, it's perhaps in a way um, it's hard to take seriously when you have many uh, TV characters and children's programs, particularly Sleepy uh, from uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, who do have funny antics when they're asleep. And you know, there's many scenes that probably you can remember from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, which are quite cute and funny when Sleepy is snoring, with droopy eyelids, falling asleep on the way to the mine. But sleep apnea in children is not cute or amusing and needs to be taken more seriously. It needs to be better recognized and better reported. Um, doctors depend on parents and, and families recognizing and reporting problems. And the impact of snoring and um, obstructive sleep apnea is often uh, underappreciated by families and not therefore mentioned as a health issue to GPs. And it might be only when we go away on the annual camping trip or there's a sleepover at the family's place that suddenly somebody recognizes that the child is um, snoring very loudly and maybe waking up very frequently. And obviously health professionals in primary care, secondary and tertiary have other priorities and so quite often there's not the time to ask about sleep issues. One of the things about the um, clinical network that we would really like to see in the future is perhaps questions around sleep focused around the before school check, because at the moment there really isn't any questions at that time about children's sleep. Or perhaps the annual flu vaccine when, when uh, children come in for that or their parents uh, with underlying respiratory conditions where OSA may be impacting as well. Or perhaps those difficult teen years when they're having the uh, HPV vaccination. This might be the rate limiting step in my presentation, but for some of you, you might not have seen a child with obstructive sleep apnea. So I'm hopefully now going to uh, show a video of a... find it quite hard to watch that video but I think it gives you a good impression of what sleep apnea looks like in children. Perhaps it doesn't sound like the people that you know who snore who may be uh, perhaps uh, you know the archetypal adult with OSA is, is um, pardon everybody else in the room but overweight middle-aged men who may um, 
have more pronounced snoring. Children often have that heavy breathing uh, sound. And when children are tired from frequent wakening overnight, they quite often are wired and inattentive and not necessarily sleepy during the day. Um, there is a preponderance of uh, OSA in adults in males, but in children it tends to affect boys and girls. And while obesity is an increasing problem in sleep apnea in children, um, children can also be completely normal size or even failing to thrive because of sleep apnea and as a consequence of their sleep destruction and the work of breathing that I think came across in, in that video. Um, <clears throat> So how can we better recognise patients in our own practice um, rather than those necessarily the, the paediatric conditions that always come to mind with OSA, which I'll come to later, but what are the things that we could look out for? And I'm going to start at the bottom bullet point in this slide because this being a respiratory conference is that a poorly controlled and severe asthmatic um, management guidelines now really uh, suggest identification and looking for recognising symptoms of sleep disordered breathing as part of their overall management. And that's whether they have or have not got allergic rhinitis that may be a component of their uh, allergic condition. But also other conditions which we've heard about this morning like non-CF bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis, there's lots of reasons why they may be awakening overnight, but there's certainly research to suggest that they may be, may be more at risk from sleep apnea and that it should be looked for. They, they have sinusitis, they may have nasal polyps, which may be contributing to their susceptibility to um, obstructive sleep apnea. Then there's a the family history in adults that you may be seeing in your practice who may, um, either mum or dad, may have had uh, adenotonsillectomy for snoring as a, as a child. There is research to suggest that, that the children of those parents, uh, those children may be at higher risk of OSA based on questionnaire studies. And then our next spe speaker, Angela Campbell, uh, has done research on adults in Wellington who've been on CPAP for OSA and in their children based on questionnaire for um, OSA have a higher uh, occurrence of uh, symptoms uh, as well. So I think seeing adults, you can also see those who may be at risk for their children as well. And then there's the, the other craniofacial uh, factors, which perhaps may be quite subtle, but added on to such things as obesity, and exposure to environmental tobacco smoke may tip some people over into having more susceptibility to sleep apnea than not. The small jaw, um, you know, many young teenagers these, de these days have braces and for crowded teeth um, or crooked teeth. And that also is a sign of underdeveloped lower and upper jaw, which then makes less space for the tongue, which could fall back and cause minor obstructions at night. So the craniofacial features of the patients that come through, the family history, whether they've got underlying chronic lung disease, and overriding all that is the, the risks associated with increased weight gain and exposure to an, an environmental tobacco smoke. So some, some figures and facts. Snoring is a very common symptom. Up to 35% of children internationally would, would have been shown to snore. In keeping with international reports, a New Zealand cross-sectional study uh, done a few years ago now by um, Barbara Gallen's group in Dunedin uh, showed that in three to four-year-old children, New Zealand parents reported snoring at least once a week uh, in just over a third of children and approximately 11% snored most nights, so one in 10. And the cardinal feature of, uh, or the cardinal symptom of OSA would be snoring at least for three nights a week, so-called habitual snoring, which they found was commoner in Māori children and also in those living in poverty. Themes that we've heard with other respiratory conditions earlier on this morning. We don't actually know the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in New Zealand. Internationally, the prevalence ranges from 1% to 5%, peaking in the preschool years, which is an association with Adeno uh, tonsillar hypertrophy. But certainly, particularly in the early teens and in the younger children, obesity is, is a major risk factor. 
in increasing children's risk of OSA by about five times. And about 50% of overweight or uh, obese children uh, are affected by OSA. I probably wouldn't have passed now the NCEA level one maths, um, but if you do some sums based on the uh, Ministry of Health health report that came out the other day, that in the just over one million children we have in, in New Zealand, um, 99,000 are obese. And if 50% of them are affected by OSA, that gives us a prevalence of at least 5%. But I think we need to acknowledge that that's just the tip of the iceberg and obesity isn't the main reason in paediatrics that we, are see, that we have OSA. It's one of the factors. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, at the moment, one of the ways that ministry are really highlighting sleep apnea in children is through the obesity and not the other ways that it may present. <clears throat> so why does it matter? What are the consequences of OSA? Well, in, in adults, we talk about um, the impact of work days lost or road traffic accidents. In children, lost school, increased hospitalizations, particularly in that year before diagnosis, and uh, reduced quality of life. But the two biggest things, um, with very strong research, so strong that I didn't put a reference on these slides, um, is neurocognitive. Uh, in terms of their development, behavior, and learning, and also the cardiovascular effects of elevated uh, blood pressure, particularly. So in the video that you saw, those uh, frequent arousals from sleep and the dips in the oxygen saturations, you, you heard the alarm going in the background, can result in impaired daytime functioning and affect schooling. But the really good thing in pediatric obstructive sleep apnea is that the, there are benefits of recognition and treatment in the uh, cost savings as well in terms of reduced health services and um, special education services, um, hospital appointments and resolution as well has been shown in terms of the cardiac effects and resolution of blood pressure changes. So there's a lot to be gained from recognizing obstructive sleep apnea in the pediatric population. The, this slide uh, shows the uh, front page or part of the front page of the Pediatric Sleep Medicine Clinical Network, which was launched in 2015. And amongst a number of uh, initiatives, one of the first ones to, was to develop uh, guidelines for the assessment and management of sleep disordered breathing in children. And just at the bottom of the slide there, you will see that there's a link um, to a summary of the guidelines, which I, should, uh, I would urge you all to have a, a look at sometime after this conference to, to sort of just re review for yourself, what can I do if I recognize sleep apnea in children? Where should I go to now? So what questions uh, does the guideline emphasize in terms of recognition? The, they're all outlined on this table here. We talked about the noisy breathing or the snoring at least three times a week, difficulty breathing, the parents afraid that their child was stopping breathing, frequent mouth breathing, and witnessing those uh, apneas that you saw in the video. And thinking of what you saw, I think out of these uh, questions, um, I think you could see that there would be four out of the five that just by seeing the video or the parents taking their own smartphone video of the children sleeping, you would be concerned. And we certainly encourage families these days, uh, if they're not sure how significant uh, then their child's noisy breathing or sleep disturbances is to do a short video. And this cartoon that I show in this slide uh, was on the front page of a New Zealand doctor uh, article, November 2015, which again is a good resource in terms of just review of the guidelines if anyone was interested. Um, but you can see that the odds ratios here for particularly struggling to breathe are five times more likely to have significant OSA than not. And then there's the daytime symptoms while we talk about being wired and cranky during the day. There's the recurrence of a nocturnal enuresis, so bed wetting after they've been dry at night is also perhaps a, a sign. Um, but also the red flag that I put there against the daytime naps sort of goes against what I was saying about being wired and inattentive. 
but children between the ages of nine, uh, five to 10 are the least likely to have naps during the day. And, and quite often when we have severe OSA, perhaps related to obesity, this is where children are actually having sleeps and falling asleep at school in this age group. And so I think that should be a real red flag that this is not normal for children. <clears throat> so in terms of the guidelines and screening for sleep issues in general, we um, felt that the beers monomic was a really good way of asking some questions about sleep issues in general in children. And the, the other... Um, letters for the B, E, A, and R are outlined in the guidelines, but the, the important one for today's presentation is the, the S, the snoring. And so if they say yes to that, then the guidelines suggest then going on to one of the validated um, sleep questionnaires, and we chose the Cherwin or Pediatric Sleep Questionnaire, um, which is for children over two years of age, not less than two. And it's a series of 22 questions, the top eight being mainly focused on OSA. And this has been uh, the responses. If you get seven correct responses, then that's validated against um, a full PSG evidence of OSA with a sensitivity and specificity for OSA greater than five events per hour of between 70 to 80%. So while no, it's not 100%, it's still uh, an indicator. And what to look for, I've already alluded to some of the things, the overall growth of the child, the craniofacial features, what the nasal uh, airflow is like. But along with the blood pressure, the thing that we really do uh, is very helpful when children are directed to either ENT pediatricians or sleep med medicine specialists uh, at referral is for them to look in the throat and to look at the size of the tonsils because this is the primary reason usually in children why they're having sleep apnea. And this is just taken straight from the guidelines showing you how you would measure the size of the tonsil. It's supposed to be in an ungagged way. So you have, you know, that's difficult because once you stick a spatula in child's mouth, the tonsils move together. So but if you can manage to do that, then if you draw a line down the uvula and look at then 25%, 50%, 75% and touching is the 1, 2, 3 and 4 grade. And anything over 1, or certainly 2 plus, is significant and the child may well benefit from having adenoids and tonsils removed. So as well as the at-risk uh, patients, in paediatrics there are the conditions which have very high risk increased pre prevalence and probably severity of OSA as well. These should be even higher on our radar than um, uh, other children, as quite often with intervention like having tonsils and adenoids removed, their OSA is less likely to resolve. So Down syndrome has been highlighted there, post-palate surgery, neuromuscular conditions, and other craniofacial syndromes as well. So when and where to refer? Most normal children with a good history of OSA and adenotonsillar hypertrophy do not need any further investigations. You don't even really need to complete that questionnaire, the validated questionnaire. And they should be referred through probably in the first instance to ENT for assessment and consideration of adenotonsillectomy. But whatever the tonsillar size, if children have habitual snoring and other historical factors strongly suggestive of OSA, these should still be referred through to uh, ENT maybe and or a paediatrician for more investigation. Who may refer on to other specialist paediatric sleep medicine services? Other tests that paediatricians uh, and some ENT specialists are, are around the country have access to is oximetry. And we in New Zealand do quite heavily depend on uh, uh, screening oximetry at times. Um, there is a certain amount of clinical risk with this, however. Um, for those of you not familiar with oximetry, there's an, this is an abnormal tracing which is shown on the bottom of uh, a number of hours overnight. And you can see the top line, there's discrete dips in the oxygen saturation is in pockets over the night down to the 80s. This would be considered as a, as a, a positive or abnormal oximetry study and along with a good history of OSA would be quite specific 98% of the time and positively predicted, have a positive predicted value of 97% for OSA. However, a normal or negative uh, uh, study uh, does not exclude 
obstructive sleep ap apnea. And so when you have a normal study, the level of oxygen saturations may be within the normal range, but you don't have any clusters of desaturations. The child, 50% of the time, may have mild or moderate obstructive sleep apnea um, <clears throat> and may need to go on for more formal sleep study evaluation. So because the adenoids and tonsils are the primary reason for uh, underlying uh, OSA, adenotonsillectomy is the first line of treatment and remains so, along with if there is obesity weight management programs. So if, if there is an otherwise healthy child with OSA on history and hypertrophy with a grade of greater than or two or greater, then adenotonsillectomy will uh, have resolution of their symptoms in about 80% of cases. But we still need to check, therefore, that when a child has T's and A's for snoring or, or OSA, that their symptoms do resolve. Um, <clears throat> and usually afterwards, uh, they can have improved growth, which can be a little bit tri tricky if they start off with obesity. Again, the weight management program is very important as well and supportive for exercise as well. Um, but there is certainly evidence for improved behaviour and mental functioning. I haven't gone into detail about any of the other treatments, but certainly for mild OSA, nasal steroids can be quite useful. Montelukast also, but not funded, obviously. And we have a significant number of children in New Zealand who are on CPAT or non-invasive ventilation for OSA. Um, and other ENT surgeries may be considered. But further evaluation for a full assessment of severity of their sleep disordered breathing may well be required before that. So to finish on uh, perhaps a bit more of a political note, um, while we do, most DHBs have uh, access to oximetry and ENT services and excellent uh, primary, secondary care, our health systems and resources for evaluating uh, sleep disordered breathing, which doesn't quite fit the bill, and needs to catch up with the health needs. And I think uh, some of the goals of the clinical network is over the next few years is to try and uh, look at the inequity of access within different DHBs uh, as to the availability of adenotonsillectomy and ENT services. Um, the Availability of diagnostic sleep medicine services in children is a vulnerable service, however you define vulnerable, and needs a, a boost and um, certainly is not uh, accessible as easily to everyone around the country as it should be. And if we benchmarked our services to uh, international standards, we certainly would uh, not reach the mark. So hopefully, uh, just by my quick gloss over of sleep apnea in children, um, I've given you enough information to perhaps think about getting paediatric sleep and sleep apnea on your radar, in your clinical practice, whatever that might be. Because sleep apnea in children does matter. Um, snoring in itself may be a sign of, uh, of OSA and have serious consequences for that family. Recognize, recognize, recognize. Help families to uh, recognize sleep apnea and present. Using their smartphones and having videos is, is very helpful. Um, and over the next few years, I think we all need to advocate, advocate for better pediatric sleep medicine services to improve the health uh, and sleep of our New Zealand children. Thank you.